grab your ankles and kiss your ass goodbye because the planet is doomed. And look, we're not talking about any particular or immediate threat. It's just a hypothetical doomsday scenario today. In fact, it can't be any immediate threat for this exercise because we currently have no way to move people off this planet en masse. Let's assume for a moment that we did. It's some distant point in the future where our ability to travel through space has dramatically improved because it's a bit shit right now. And we're also going to assume that this doomsday scenario that we're being presented with doesn't allow us the hundreds or possibly thousands of years necessary to terraform Mars or Venus, assuming that that is even possible. It's a really long way off. Or if you want to assume that Mars will already be terraformed by such a distant point in the future, then let's just say that our theoretical apocalypse is going to destroy the entire solar system because, well, when you go big, go big. Look, the details of exactly how we got to this point are not really important. What matters is that death is coming for us all. So we really need to get the hell out of here as fast as possible. So if humans both possess the technology to leave our solar system and urgently needed to, where are we gonna go? While there are scores of potentially habitable exoplanets that have been studied and tens of billions of others that should exist, we can easily narrow down our options to just three possibilities. We can go to the nearest habitable planet, we can go to the best habitable planet, or we could just go nowhere in particular. closest option. Proxima Centauri b is the closest planet to the star Proxima Centauri in the Alpha Centauri star system. That is a lot of Centauri. It's located in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri and is only 4.2 light years away from Earth, making it the nearest habitable planet. We may not be able to travel faster than light or even close to the speed of light, but even if we could get to just a quarter of the speed of light, this would be a perfectly reasonable journey. Sure, it would still take 16 years, but the same people who left Earth would be alive to see the journey to completion. A lot of them would, anyway, 16 years, some people are gonna die. Anyway, the idea that a habitable planet is that close to us sounds pretty good, and it makes it seem like an ideal location for humanity to head to. Unfortunately, it turns out that scientists are pretty liberal when it comes to their use of the phrase potentially habitable. The main criteria used for a planet to be potentially habitable is that it must be in the sun's habitable zone. That's the area around the sun which liquid water could theoretically exist. This is obviously an important inclusion as all living things on Earth require water. It's a reasonable jumping off point and Proxima Centauri b has some other things going for it as well. Most notably, while the planet's radius is 30% larger than Earth's, it has a very similar mass. The surface gravity on Proxima Centauri b should only be about 2-3% to greater than the gravity here on Earth. That is of massive importance, and so far, things are looking pretty darn good. Beyond this, there's actually surprisingly little we know about our potential new home, but what we know isn't exactly brilliant. Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf star that is much smaller and much colder than our Sun, and as such, its habitable zone is much, much closer. The exoplanet is 20 times closer to its sun than we are to ours, which creates, well, a few issues. Chief among these issues is that we can't actually get a good picture of the planet because it's too close to the star. To date, not even the James Webb Space Telescope has been able to take a detailed image of Proxima Centauri b. Now, if you seem to recall seeing headlines that contradict that statement, we assume that you were just reading clickbait lies because it totally hasn't happened. There was some speculation that the JWST would be capable of detecting artificial visual lights on the planet's surface, like city lights on Earth that are visible from space. Even though it was only speculated that the telescope had the ability to do this if such lights were to exist, it suddenly began being reported that it had actually done this. It absolutely hadn't. Had photographs revealing city lights on another planet been taken, we can assure you that it would have been bigger news. <laughs> and sadly, uh, there are no good photos of the exoplanet. Instead, we're going to have to rely on good old-fashioned maths and scientific analysis of what we do know. And, like we said, what we know isn't great. It may be a planet with similar gravity that's in the habitable zone of its star, but it's on the colder end of what would be habitable with an equilibrium temperature of minus 39 degrees Celsius, a bit colder than Earth's minus 18 Celsius. But being slightly colder than Earth isn't really a problem thanks to how close the planet is to its sun. The closer an object is to whatever it's orbiting around, the more likely it is to be tidally locked. It is assumed the Proxima Centauri b is in such a tidally locked state, meaning the the same side of the planet is always facing the sun. Half of the planet would be unbearably hot and the other half would be unbearably cold. There's also this 
pesky little thing called radiation that has a tendency to, you know, kill everything. Proxima Centauri b receives anywhere from 10 to 60 times as much ultraviolet radiation as Earth, which is more than a little setback. The problems actually keep going, but you probably get the idea. It turns out that a planet needs more than the potential for liquid water to actually be habitable, and it doesn't look like Proxima Centauri b is gonna do the trick. That shouldn't honestly be a big surprise, though. I mean, what were the odds that the most accommodating planet would actually be the one closest to us? If humanity really wants a planet to call home, we're going to need to find the most suitable option available. The closest match. In 2009, the Kepler Space Telescope was launched with a simple mission. Find Earth 2.0. Thousands of planets and suspected planets were catalogued until finally they found the planet that would be nicknamed Earth 2.0. It's not an exact match of Earth by any means, but it was the best they found. The planet is Kepler 452b, discovered on June the 23rd, 2015. But look, Proxima Centauri b was an unwieldy enough name, and this one is even worse, so instead of calling it Kepler 452b, we're just gonna call it Billy. Billy is what's known as a super-Earth exoplanet on account of being significantly larger than Earth. Its radius is 60% larger and its mass is five times that of Earth. That size may sound like a bit of an issue, what with gravity and all, but it isn't actually that bad. While the surface gravity on Billy is 1.9 times that of our gravity, that's not unlivable. Experiments have been performed showing that people can survive at 1.8 g's indefinitely without any negative consequences, and it's believed that the same would be true at 2 g's as well. One of the pieces of evidence used by scientists to draw this conclusion was the existence of obese people. There may be other health risks associated with it, but a person who weighs twice as much as an average person of their height is still capable of existing normally. Their muscles can support movement and their bones don't shatter under the pressure. Though for anyone wanting to live on Billy's surface, there may need to be strict guidelines about a person's BMI. Even if their weight is entirely from muscle, doubling a weight that is already considered high could start to cause some serious problems. But let's get past the whole gravity thing. Living at 2 Gs is not ideal, but it is doable. So what's the rest of the situation like? Well, as a small, coldish red dwarf, Proxima Centauri wasn't exactly ideal for hosting life, but Billy's sun is a Type G2V star, the same type as our sun. It is slightly larger and more massive, but its surface temperature only differs from our sun by about 20 Kelvin. Considering these temperatures are pushing 6,000 Kelvin, a difference of only 20 is essentially nothing. Billy also orbits its sun at a distance of 1.04 astronomical units. That's 4% further than we are from our sun. With an equilibrium temperature of minus 8 degrees Celsius, it's a bit warmer than Earth, though probably not much. In fact, it sounds rather nice. Earth's actual surface temperature is significantly higher than its equilibrium temperature thanks to our atmosphere and the greenhouse effect. It's speculated that Billy's higher gravity could actually dull these effects a bit, meaning the surface temperature may be very similar to our own. So far, things looking pretty good. Given the distance from its sun, it's very unlikely that Billy would be tidally locked, though oh, we do not know how fast it's spinning. What we do know is that its orbital rotation is 384 Earth days, so a year uh, would be pretty similar in length. Those extra 19 days in the year would also give me lots of extra time to make YouTube videos. If a day is similar in length to an Earth day as well, life on Billy could seem very familiar to life on Earth. Not that anyone living there would have any idea what Earth was like like, though, without the ability to travel faster than light, the journey to this new planet to call home would take many, many generations. You see, Billy is 1800 light years away from our solar system, which is also why so many details about the planet are unknown. Could be a completely perfect substitute for Earth, aside from double the gravity, but our telescopes are just not powerful enough to give us the necessary level of detail to be sure. Unfortunately, we won't know a lot more about Billy until the next generation of telescopes or later. As impressive as the JWST is it seems to be focused on much closer exoplanets, so it may be a while before we learn anything else. From what we do know, things look pretty good thus far, but even if it was perfect, God only knows how we'd travel to a planet that is so bloody far away. And that brings us to the final possible destination. Nowhere in particular. Instead of seeking out some distant planet to colonize, why not just build a giant spaceship or space station? We've actually already got people living in space on the International Space Station, so why don't we just do that on a really much bigger scale and I don't know, worry about finding somewhere to land later on? Considering that we may need a generation or spaceship anyway to get where we're going, this seems like a perfectly reasonable response. We already have people living on the International Space Station, so we must have already figured out all of this living in space. 
face stuff, right? Well, <laughs> no surprises. The answer to that is no. You're probably already aware, but people can't live on the ISS indefinitely. They are subjected to increased levels of radiation, their muscles atrophy despite extensive exercise, and they suffer a 1% loss of bone density every single month. It's not currently a long-term viable solution. That's not to say it's impossible, but there are some major hurdles that we would need to overcome first. One of the biggest hurdles is the creation of artificial gravity. Aside from the havoc that low gravity can play on our bodies, there are other practical issues associated with low gravity as well. Moving civilization into a space station means that new generations will need to be born in space, and if you've ever seen experiments from the ISS where astronauts show off the strange ways that water behaves in low gravity, you may already see where this is going. The act of procreation and bodily fluids involved would, well, we'll just let you use your imagination. But whatever you're thinking of, don't forget that sweat would also stick to and coat your entire body as well, making for a rather uncomfortable experience. There's also a strong likelihood that a fetus would not develop properly in microgravity and that giving birth may be extremely difficult. Even if a healthy baby is born, their heart wouldn't have developed needing to fight against gravity. If a human born in space were to attempt to go to an Earth-like planet, their heart simply wouldn't be strong enough to pump blood through their body. In addition to artificial gravity, we're also going to need a more effective way to protect everybody on board from radiation. We have some forms of radiation shielding that are effective enough for people staying in space for six months or so at a time, but it's not good enough for permanent residency. Then there's the issues of food and water, controlling the size of the population, essentially assigning every newborn a specific job to further the existence of the space station. It all just sounds rather miserable. And look, there are honestly too many issues to go into, and maybe we'll revisit Generation Starships in a later episode on this channel. The short version is that there is not a great solution for humanity without unimaginable scientific advances, as well as having the most disciplined society that we've ever seen. But it's still maybe better than trying to reach a planet that we probably would never reach. Wrap up. So look, if Earth is doomed, where do we go? Honestly, none of the options are very good. The nearest habitable planet is almost certainly a f***ing horrible place, and the planet most closely resembling Earth is really, really far away. And no matter where we're going, unless we have already invented warp drives, then it's almost certainly going to involve multiple generations born and raised in space, which is a whole other set of issues. But even if those issues are solved, for the sake of our collective sanity, permanent existence on a space station is just not ideal for humanity at least not unless we actually have things like holodecks to entertain us, which we don't. Realistically, our best option is just to hope that we're never faced with a decision like this, because there are no good solutions. We'd be much better off planning ahead by taking on the Herculean task of terraforming Mars just in case and praying that if Earth is somehow destroyed that the entire solar system isn't taken out as well. Fingers crossed. Thanks for watching.